the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. And the faith of Jesus. Welcome to another uh, presentation as we go through this uh, prophecy seminar, Take Ye Away the Stone. Um, in this seminar, we aim to remove some of the prejudices that many may have against the truth of the seven times as seen here on the 1843 chart. Uh, many have been led to, 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 to fight this truth. Many have been led to reject it. Many have been led to look at it. Uh, in a very skeptical way, simply because of what they've been told by leaders, many of whom are teaching false messages. All right. In, in, our, in our previous presentations, we, we went through these things showing how these blind leaders are making men blind, which is why the message today uh, uh, for the church of Laodicea is so important because the Bible says they know not that they are blind, miserable, poor and naked. And this blindness is what Christ is seeking to heal. Now, um, as we continue, we pray that these messages will be a blessing to you and that it'll, you will see the Bible in a new way. So without further ado, let us kneel uh, for prayer and invite God's presence into uh, this day's presentation. <clears throat> Merciful Father, Lord, we thank you for this blessed uh, evening and this blessed time you have given us to spend time in your word, uh, to teach the truth, uh, to learn, but most of all, O oh Lord, to grow into the stature and image of Christ. For Lord, when you come to investigate, you are looking for your son and your people. And so we pray that, that even now these truths may be calculated to form the character of Christ within us. Please forgive us for our sins. Please create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, so in yesterday's presentation, or should I say in the previous presentation, we introduced the story of Esau, showing that Esau represents those who sell their birthright. And a birthright is anything that you, are, uh, that you have a right to simply because you were born into it. For instance, as an American citizen, you have a right to protections of the Constitution, whereas as a Seventh-day Adventist, you have a right to the promises that comes along with keeping the Sabbath and receiving the spirit of prophecy. You have a right to all those things. All right. And so we saw that the parable of the 10 virgins in the parable of the 10 virgins, you have two classes, the wise and the foolish, the wise, they know they're right. All right. And because of that, the wise stored up on the oil that is needed to take them through the midnight cry. Whereas the foolish, they didn't gather the oil. And thus, the foolish were told, go to them that, buy, that sell and buy for yourselves. And we saw that those that sell are Esau. Esau represents those that sell. What are they selling? They're selling their birthright. Okay? So Esau is those false ministers within the Advent movement that are selling the truths that were once given to the saints. Selling it for what? For a system of intellectual philosophy. All right. In 1SM204, Sister White says that uh, the men who would start the new organization, they would give up the principles that, that they had for the past 50 years. And when Sister White wrote this text, the past 50 years took you to 1840 to 1844. All right. And she says the Sabbath would be lightly regarded. And they would, they would follow men rather than God. These men are the Esau's that's in the Seventh-day Adventist church. This new organization. Esau wanted to start a new thing. He wanted all the benefits of the birthright without having to uphold what the birthright called for. So we saw that this is the condition of the Seventh-day Adventist church at present. There's a bunch of Esau's at the head of our organization who wants all the benefits of what it means to be an Adventist, but refuses 
to do the work, refuses to teach the truths that are found on the first, second, uh, uh, sorry, on the 1840, 40, 1843, and the 1850 chart. All right? And so, we also saw that that character would be revealed at midnight. Because Sister White says, it, a char character is revealed in crisis. When the earnest voice goes forth at midnight, it will be seen who had make, made preparation. It will be seen who had faith in the promises of God. And that midnight hour, when that midnight hour comes, the bridegroom is not there. Because the, the parable says there is a delay. In other words, Christ delays for a moment. And one place we see that delay clearly is on the cross. Christ died Friday. He rested on the Sabbath. And he was resurrected on the first day of the week. In that day he was resting, there was a delay. All right? And let us read now from the Desire of Ages. And let us put this understanding together. And let us show what happens when there is that delay. Okay? Desire of Ages 776, paragraph 1. DA 776.1. Sister White says, Never had Christ attracted the attention of the multitude as now that he was laid in the tomb. According to the, their practice, the people brought their sick and suffering ones to the temple courts, inquiring, Who can tell us of Jesus of Nazareth? Many had come af from afar to find him who had healed the sick and raised the dead. On every side was heard the cry, we want Christ the healer. So in that moment, in that moment when there is a delay, when, when Christ delays, uh, when Christ is not there, because that's what the delay teaches, many will cry, we want Christ the healer. But the wise will say to the foolish, go and buy. All right? Because when Christ was here healing, you refused him. Now he's gone, everybody's coming for Christ the healer. This is what the leaders of the, this is the condition that the leaders of this Seventh-day Adventist church is putting the people in. In a condition for the little space when Christ will not show himself as a test to the people of God to see if they have faith, all right, to see if they have oil in the lamp, many at that time will come for healing and would not be able to find it. It says, upon this occasion, those who were thought to show indications of the leprosy were examined by the priests. Many were forced to hear their husbands, wives, or children pronounced leprous and doomed to go forth from the shelter of their homes and the care of their friends to warn off the stranger with the mournful cry, unclean, unclean. In that moment, in that crisis, those who cannot find Christ will be doomed. Let us continue. The friendly hands of Jesus of Nazareth that never refused to touch the healing with healing the loathsome leper were folded on his breast. A folded arms means the work is suspended. The lips that answered his petition with comforting words, I will be thou clean, were now silent. Many appealed to the chief priests and rulers for sympathy and relief, but in vain. All right? In that time, this is when the foolish, the wise says unto the foolish, go to them that sell and buy for yourselves. You see, in the time of Christ, the leaders, the Pharisees of the day, they sold Christ. They sold Christ to the Romans. There's a story in the Bible that illustrates that. When you go to the book of Genesis, what did Joseph's brothers do? They sold Joseph to the Egyptians. And what did they tell? What did they tell Jacob? A wild beast mauled the child. Well, it's the same thing they did to Christ. They sold him to that wild beast. Revel Daniel chapter 7 tells us that Rome is that wild beast. And so the, 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 the Jews, the ten brothers, illustrating, illustrated by the ten brothers, sold Christ, Joseph, to the wild beast. All right. And so in that time, in that time, 
It says, many appeal to the chief priests and the rulers for sympathy, but in vain. In other words, they went to buy. They went to buy oil. They went to buy healing. They went to buy truth. But Esau is only a seller of the birthright. Let us continue. Apparently, they were determined to have the living Christ among them again. With persistent earnestness, they asked for him. They could not be turned away, but they were driven from the temple courts and soldiers were stationed at the gates to keep back the multitude that came with their sick and dying, demanding entrance. Let us continue. Paragraph 2. The sufferers who had come to be healed by the Savior sank under the disappointment. The streets were filled with mourning. The sick were dying for want of the healing touch of Jesus. It's going to be a terrible time when Jesus hides his face from the Seventh-day Adventist church. Many will die. Many will die for want of healing. It says, physicians were consulted in vain. There was no skill like that of him who lay in the tomb. The morning cries of the suffering ones brought home to thousands of minds the conviction, excuse me, the conviction that a great light had gone out of the world. Without Christ, the earth was blackness and darkness. Keep that in mind. Many whose voices had swelled the cry of crucify him, crucify him, now realize the calamity that had fallen upon them and would as eagerly have cried, give us Jesus had he still been alive. All right. So she says that the earth was blackness and darkness. Brethren, Matthew chapter 25 says at midnight, there was a cry. Midnight is the darkest hour of the night. Christ in the grave was the darkest hour in earth's history. And the foolish, those who failed to gather the oil while Christ was alive, was asking those ministers, those Esau's, to sell, to sell them what they had. But it was too late. Esau was already rejected. But not only that, Esau had nothing more to sell. He already sold the birthright. And so those people were left with nothing. She says in vain, in vain they went to the physicians. In vain they went to the priests and rulers. Let us continue. Before we continue, are we going to wait until it's too late to gather the oil? Are we going to come to a time when we would go to these Adventist leaders and say, give us of the oil? When it is too late? At the Sunday law, it is too late. Many believe that at the Sunday law, they're going to be able to make a decision. At the Sunday law, it is too late. We must recognize the coming of the bridegroom long before the Sunday law. The Sunday law is the darkest hour in this earth's history. The Sunday law is the time for Seventh-day Adventists when they are to demonstrate their character, not make a character. So if anyone is out there teaching that the Sunday law, at the Sunday law is where we're going to get ourselves together, that is incorrect. As Seventh-day Adventists, we must be together long before. When Christ is in the grave, it's too late. All right? So let us continue. When people had learned that Jesus had been put to death by the priests, inquiries were made regarding his death. The particulars of his trial were kept as private as possible. But during the time when he was in the grave, his name was on thousands of lips, and reports of his mock trial and of the inhumanity of the priests and rulers were circulated everywhere. By men of intellect, these priests and rulers were called upon to explain the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning the Messiah. And while trying to frame some falsehood in reply, they became like insane men. 
in that time, the ministers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to become insane. While trying to explain what happened, where um, explain the prophecies of the Old Testament that they had rejected or, or that they had sold because that was a part of their birthright, right? A part of the birthright of the Jewish people was to explain the prophecies of the Old Testament to keep people in anticipation of the Messiah. They sold it. Like Esau, they sold it. And now the people came to those that sell and ask for oil. And there is no oil. These men are insane. They will become insane. Mark my words. Ministers in the Seventh-day Adventist Church are going to sound like madmen when that time comes. Let us continue. The prophecies that pointed to Christ's sufferings and death, they could not explain. In other words, the prophecies pointing to the Sunday law, Seventh-day Adventist ministers will not be able to explain. The truths that explain it is on these charts. It's on these charts. And right now, they're selling it. They're out there telling people that we shouldn't blame Rome for changing the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. They're out there telling people that Rome has changed. That she's better now. That she's no longer the Rome of the past. When Rome themselves say that she never changes. With all these truths, with all these truths on the chart, we would not be able to explain what is coming, especially the truth of the seven times. The seven times lead you to know God and to understand the fulfillment of prophecy, past, present, and future. Let us continue. She says, the prophecies that pointed to Christ's sufferings and death, they could not explain. And many inquirers were convinced that the scriptures had been fulfilled. The day which they thought never would come had at last taken them as in a sneer. And the involuntary language of their anguished heart is, The great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now this quote I'm reading from the Daniel and Revelation, page 434, paragraph 3. This last uh, paragraph, this last sentence. And your Smith is talking about when Christ comes and he finds the wicked unprepared. Just like when Christ was in the grave and the people came, the wicked were unprepared. The priests and, and, and rulers were unprepared to help the people. The people were unprepared to be without Christ. All right. And in that time, the Bible says that in that time, they will run to the rocks and say, fall on us and hide us. The Pharisees, they wish they could have hide on that Sabbath. All right. I'm sure they wish they could have hide on that Sabbath because the people came to them and they had nothing to give to them. But let us continue. Erasmus says, Before it is called out by the fearful sins of time, we pray you, reader, give the most serious and candid attention to this subject. What subject? The great day of his wrath. What truth teaches about the wrath of God? The seven times. Let us continue. Many now affect to despise the institution of prayer, but at one time or another, all men will pray. Those who will not pray now to God in penitence will then pray to the rocks and mountains in despair, and this will be the largest prayer meeting ever held. As you read these lines, think whether you would like to have a part therein. Now, I'm just bringing these principles together that I want us to understand. They're not the same exact things happening, but the principles of God's dealing with men is ever the same. The principles that are wrapped up in those stories are the same. On that Sabbath, the people came for, to look for Christ. Christ was nowhere to be found. They went to the rabbis. The rabbis became insane men. There was no help for the people. That was a great day of prayer. The people were seeking Christ that day. But in vain were their prayers. In the second coming, the wicked 
would run to the rocks, just like the people ran to the Pharisees, and they would say, fall on us, hide us, all right, from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne. And Uriah Smith tells us, it's the greatest prayer meeting there ever will be. But Christ would be hid from them, just like Christ was hid in the grave on that faithful Sabbath in, uh, 2,000 years ago. All right? So, it's very, very important that the truths on these charts are understood, especially the seven times. God gave me a little commencement of the chain of truth, and he commenced with the seven times. When you look at this chart, it says 677, the commencement of the seven times. All right? So, it is very important, this particular truth. You may find, you may say, why are these guys pressing this truth home so much? This is the stone that the builders reject. This is the particular truth that the Adventist church have rejected that is leading God's people astray. And when the cry goes, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, many will awake without this truth. Many will awake not ready for Christ. And they will be told, go, go to them that buy and sell. Do you want to be among those that would go to Esau? Do you want to be an Esau and sell your birthright? You have a right to the understanding of these truths. If only you will bend your knees and ask God via his Holy Spirit to teach it to you. So, You can, either be, you can either be Esau, who hates these truths and is selling the birthright, just like the ministers who hates these truths and is selling the birthright. Or you can be Jacob, who longed for the birthright. Not only the blessings that came with it, but especially for the role of high priest or the role of priest or the priesthood that came with that birthright. So let us read. Patriots and Prophets, page 178, paragraph 1, Sister White says, Isaac made known to his sons these privilege, the privileges and conditions and plainly stated that Esau, as the eldest one, was, was the entitled one to the birthright. So here, the birthright comes with privileges and conditions. Esau wanted the privileges, but not live up to the conditions. Just like our seven Adventist leaders today, who wants the privilege? And not live up to the conditions. The only conditional prophecy in the scriptures is found in Leviticus chapter 26. If you obey, blessings. If you disobey, cursings. All right? It's, it, that, it's, a, it's as simple as that. The birthright is one of privileges that comes with a condition. Okay? Now, are you going to be among the foolish virgins or are you going to be among the wise? Are you going to be an Esau or are you going to be a Jacob? Continuing on, it says, But Esau had no love for devotion, no inclination to a religious life. The requirements that accompanied the spiritual birthright were an unwelcome and even hateful restraint to him. Esau hated the conditions that were placed to receive the birthright. The law of God, which was the condition of the divine commandment covenant with Abraham, was regarded by Esau as a yoke of bondage. The Seventh-day Adventist church, whom the Lord has set up on, um, since October 22nd, 1844, and have made a covenant with, sees these truths, as a yoke of bondage. Even the 2300 days. Don't let them fool you. Lip service is given to the 2300 days. Because we cannot get rid of October 22nd, 1844. It's plastered in history. However, they don't like it. They don't like it because they don't know how to explain it away. It is a yoke of bondage to the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's a heavy burden that these leaders are carrying. And when they find a way to get rid of it, they will try. But it's easier for them to touch the 2520 
And so they've gone ahead and touched the 2520, thinking that they're doing God a service. Let us continue. Esau hated the restraint that came with these truths. That's what the Bible is teaching. All right? So let us continue. Bent on self-indulgence. What did Esau bent on? Self-indulgence. He desired nothing so much as liberty to do as he pleased. Our leaders in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ted Wilson, chief among them. Now, I don't want you to think that this is just an effort to bad talk these ministers. But the Bible is plain. The spirit of prophecy is plain. It says here plainly, they regard the birthright or the conditions of the divine covenant as a yoke of bondage. All right? And it says that they were bent on self-indulgence. It says he desired nothing so much as liberty to do as he pleased. These are not my words. This is the words that God gave to Ellen White to pen. This is another reason why they hate the spirit of prophecy. Because it rebukes them and it records their activities. I don't have to be there in the general conference to see that they hate. The scripture tells us that they hate these truths. And so you will never see one of those charts in the conference churches. There may be one or two bold ministers that might do it, all right? But in some far-flung corner, all right? But you will never see one of these big mainstream churches carrying these two charts, all right? And the more you call it out, eventually, they'll, they have to give it lip, lip service. But let us continue. It says, To him, that's Esau, power and riches, feasting and reveling were happiness. He gloried in the unrestrained freedom of his wild, roving life. That's the condition of our leaders in the church today. That's why there is a fight against the foundation of our faith. Next paragraph, Patri Patriarchs and Prophets, 178, paragraph 2. Sister White says, Jacob had learned from his mother of the divine intimation that the birthright should fall to him. And he was filled with an unspeakable desire for the privileges which it would confer. It was not the possession of his father, father's wealth that he craved. The spiritual birthright was the object of his longing. Esau, foolish virgin. Jacob, wise virgin. He longed for the spiritual blessings that came with the birthright. Because with the spiritual blessings comes the natural blessings anyway. Esau wanted the natural blessing without the spiritual blessing. Jacob is the opposite. And in our, in, in our study, we saw that Jacob, he wrestled with God and prevailed. In other words, he, he confirmed the words of this covenant. He wrestled for the blessing. He says, I will not let thee go until thou bless me. He wrestled to fulfill this covenant. Brethren, let us not be like Esau. Let us be like Jacob. Esau represents both leaders and people. And this is something we want to understand. Esau represents the leaders who are selling their birthright, but it also represents the people who are following these leaders who are selling our birthright. Esau is both leaders and people. So when I say Esau, don't think for a moment in your mind that it's only the leaders. Because Christ says if the blind lead the blind, they both fall in a ditch. So it's not just Esau. I mean, sorry, it's not just leaders. It's both, it's both leaders and people. Let us continue. Let us read about Jacob. To commune with God, as did righteous Abraham, to offer the sacrifice of atonement for his family, to be the progenitor of the chosen people and of the promised Messiah, and to inherit the immortal possession embraced in the blessings of the covenant, here were the privileges and honors that kindled the most ardent, his most ardent desires. His mind was ever reaching forward to the future and seeking to grasp its unseen 
blessings. Jacob had the mind of Christ in disregard. All right? Because even though he craved the blessing, there was one problem with Jacob. Right? His name meant supplanter. Okay? He was not yet converted. Even though he had that desire, he had that part of his mind correct. He was not yet converted. As we would see in his trickery um, uh, with Isaac. Okay? But let us continue. With secret longing, he listened to all that his father told concerning the spiritual birthright. He carefully treasured what he had learned from his mother. Day and night, the subject occupied his thoughts until it became the absorbing interests of his life. But while he does esteem ex external, ex but while he does esteem external above temporal blessings, Jacob had not not external, eternal. But while he does esteem eternal above temporal blessings, Jacob had not an experimental knowledge of the God whom he revered. So here we see that Jacob had truth. He had not experience. All right. And, and Sister White says truth, experience, and duty is the landmarks, the old landmarks, that God gave to his people. So Jacob had the truth, the birthright, but he had not an experience. All right? You need the truth and an experience in order to understand your duty. So continuing on. She says, His heart had not been renewed by divine grace. He believed that the promise concerning himself could not be fulfilled so long as Esau retained the rights of the firstborn. And he constantly studied to devise some way whereby he might secure the blessing by which his brother by which his brother held so lightly but which was so precious to himself and with that Jacob tricked Esau or he coerced Esau into selling the birthright now Esau Jacob was wrong Esau was Esau wrong also yes Esau was not supposed to sell the birthright but because Esau only had temporal things on his mind, it mattered not to him. He says, I am at the point to die. In other words, he came face to face with death. And in that moment, he sold his birthright. All right. The, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they saw that if Christ didn't die, or if someone didn't die, right, they were going to lose their place in the nation. That's what Caiaphas said. They came face to face with death and they sold their birthright. And all that Sabbath, men came to look for Christ and he was not found. And the Bible says, Esau saw, Esau, uh, though he sought repentance, um, Esau found not repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. All right? Protestants, they sold their birthright. So the Lord rose up Seventh-day Adventists. And even now, Seventh-day Adventists is selling their birthright. They're selling the truths that has made them Seventh-day Adventists. Holding on to the name because of the benefits that comes with it, but not living the experience. All right? So, when we come back in our next presentation, we'll look, we'll continue looking at the parable of the Ten Virgins in light of this particular story, and we'll see what happens when the birthright was given to Jacob, all right? Even though he tricked uh, Esau to get the birthright, but we'll see that Christ covered that sin, all right? So shall we close here with the word of prayer? And I pray that these messages uh, is helping you. I know that as a human, um, I'm not the best at explaining some of these things, but I pray that you will go to God and ask him to explain it to you for yourself. Shall we close with prayer? Merciful Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, your goodness and your grace towards us. Father, please uh, hide me, O Lord, uh, from these things. Lord, I know I'm not the best at explaining, but Lord, where I fail, I pray that you will make up for the lack and that uh, your voice will be heard in these truths, O Lord, not mine, but yours, and that men may indeed fall on their knees, fall on the rock and be broken, pleading with you for an understanding of these truths, 
for it is uh, through these truths that we get we are sanctified. For your word says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Give us of your Holy Spirit, O Lord, uh, to teach us and to lead us and to guide us into all truth. And we pray that these truths will cleanse us and prepare us for your soon coming. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good evening and thank you for joining our Prophecy Seminar where we and the Habakkuk Ministry are giving you a better understanding of the seven times. We appreciate you making it this far and we hope that you are blessed with the truths that are being taught as we will continue this night after night. If you are being blessed by these truths, we ask that you like, share, and subscribe so that others will be blessed by the truth as well. Also, we ask that you click the notification bell so that you will not miss any of our future videos. Our ministry will be visiting our brethren in Jamaica from December 15th to December 28th where we will be holding daily studies and meetings. We will also be having seminars and practical demonstrations on health, as well as basic health services for the public, where they can receive simple health checkups. We also solicit your help in the form of donations as we assist the brethren there with the repairing of their building as was damaged during Hurricane Barrel. Our goal is to raise at least $2,000. You can donate via Cash App, Zelle, mail a check, or money order to the address below. If you have any questions from tonight's presentations or our mission to Jamaica, feel free to contact us via text message or WhatsApp using the number below, 423-413-3536. You can also email us at songofsolomon4.15 at gmail.com. Our website is fountainsoflivingwaters.org. We also encourage you to support our little ministry because doing the Lord's work does require funds. So we ask and would appreciate that you would support us through tithes, offering, and donations so that we can further spread the gospel. Now please stay tuned for the next presentation, which will begin shortly.
Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Good evening and welcome back to another presentation. Uh, shall we open up with a word of prayer? Merciful Father, we are once again grateful for these truths. We thank you so much for these opportunities in times of peace to spend time in your word. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us into all truth. Bless us, Lord, and help us to understand the truths for this time. Help us to understand things new and old. For you said new light is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. So help us, Lord, as we unfold the old in, a, uh, in an effort to understand the new. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. So in our last few presentations, we we're just using the parable of the ten virgins to show uh, the condition of things here at the end of the world. But we're also using the story of Esau and Jacob to help us with that understanding. We saw that Esau represents the foolish virgins. Jacob represents the, the, the wise virgins. Esau represents the false preachers at the end of the world. And also those people who are following the false preachers at the end of the world. While Jacob represents the true preachers of the gospel. Those who yearn for the truth and yearn to, 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 to meet the conditions that are necessary to be in favor with God, as well as the people who are following those shepherds, right? We also saw that there's only one prophecy in the Bible that is conditional. And that is the one found in Leviticus chapter 26, known as the seven times, or in other words, the 2520, which is the first prophecy given to the Adventist church. And we see that in our church, all, when these truths came, all, all of God's people, the Adventist church went forward with these truths. The church was raised up, but somewhere along the way, the Bible says they all slumbered and slept. And the Bible says at midnight, the cry is raised, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. When that time comes, many will be found to be without these truths that are on the 1843 and the 1850 chart. For these truths are the oil the understanding of this truth and the experience that comes with it is the oil that we need in order to go into the marriage with Christ. And after we go into the marriage, we must be found clad in the right garment, which is the mind of Christ, so that we will not be thrown out of the wedding as that man who came there without the wedding garment. And so we're going to continue with that theme of the parable of the ten virgins. All right. And in looking at Esau, and Jacob. So here we are at the point now in that story where the time has come for uh, the birthright to be, to be bestowed upon Esau and Jacob. Remember, at midnight the cry goes forward, Behold the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And all the virgins arose, the Bible says, but the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil. And the wise says, Not so, lest there be not enough for you, for us, and you. Go and buy from them that sell. All right? So Genesis chapter 27, we'll pick up from Genesis chapter 27, where Isaac is about to bestow the birthright on Esau uh, in this story. So it says, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old, and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son, and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here, here am I. And he said, Behold now, I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore, take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field, and take me some venison, and make me savory meat, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Now here, Isaac is represented as being old. All right? Now, what would represent old at the end of the world? Old and blind. In other words, he is at a point where the only thing that allows him to discern who his children are is their character, their voice, their skin. All right? That, that was the only thing, because 
When the Bible is representing him as blind, it is representing a man who is not able to recognize people by natural sight. Okay? And so he needs them to come in with other characteristics to be able to define who they are. At the end of the world, Christ is not looking for outward stuff. Christ is not looking for whether you did good. Or, no, those things come with a good character. But Christ is looking for a heart like his. The Father in the judgment will open the books and see if you measure up to his son. Not from outward looks, but from what's in the heart. He's looking to see who's the throne, who's sitting on the throne of your heart. It's the same condition here with Isaac. Okay, this story is only an illustration to give us a spiritual insight of how God will look at things at the end of the world. The natural is designed to teach the spiritual. Naturally, Isaac was blind, but it's only designed to spiritually show that the Lord is blind to outward things. All right, so let us continue. He's blind to mere uh, 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 natural things that you may bring. He wants to see what's in the heart. All right, so let us continue. Verse 26 of Genesis 27. So Esau goes out, all right, and he gets the venison, all right, and he goes out to hunt. And in the meantime, Jacob goes into Isaac, all right, all right and he gives, he presents to Isaac uh, uh, the, the, a feeling like the skin of Esau. He, sa he says, Jacob, the voice, the voice sounds like Jacob, but the skin is like Esau. So Jacob presented to him a covering, right, that represented Esau. And it was because of the covering, right, because of the garment that he had on, Jacob stole the birthright. Okay, because of his garment, Jacob stole the birthright. All right, keep that in mind. So now, we're down to verse 26, where now Esau comes back. Remember, the Bible says, it is at midnight when the cry went out, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. In other words, the blessing is on the way. Go and get it. All right? But Esau, being a hunter, had to go and get it. Just like the foolish virgins has to go and get it. And in the meantime, Jacob, the wise, went in and the door was shut on Esau. Let's see this. Esau comes back in verse 26. And the Bible says, and, Isaac, and, and his father Isaac said unto him, Come now near and kiss me, my son. Uh, I did tell the story, but um, I'll just read it. I'll read it. Uh, this is about Jacob. Jacob goes in to get the birthright. All right. Even though I told it, let us just read it. The Bible says, and, and his father Isaac said unto him, Come now near, come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment. Keep that in mind. It's the covering that Jacob has that gets him the birthright. And blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is the smell of the field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore, God give thee the dew of heaven. What is the dew? Deuteronomy chapter 32. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew. As the small rain upon the tender herbs and the showers upon the grass. Dew is the rain. Okay? So Jacob says, um, Isaac says, Therefore God give thee the dew of heaven, or the rain, the latter rain. Alright? And the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. That's the blessing. If you go to Deuteronomy, alright, it tells you plainly. In fact, not Deuteronomy. Let us go to Leviticus. Let us go to the book of Leviticus, chapter 26. And let us look at verse 4. Let us look now at verse 4. Uh, verse, verse 5, verse 3. 3 onwards. It says, If you will walk in my statutes and keep them and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield her fruit, and your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and you shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell 
in your land safely. All right. Now, go now to uh, Deuteronomy, I believe, chapter 30. Either 30 or 28, but let Deuteronomy chapter, we'll start with chapter 30. Sorry. All right, go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 14. Deuteronomy 11 and verse 14. Once again, Deuteronomy 11 and verse 14. In other words, um, as a matter of fact, we'll start with verse 13. It says, And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you rain in your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn, thy wine, and thine oil. All right? Same thing we read in the notes. I am on page 49 in my notes. And it says, it says that Isaac blessed Jacob. And then it says in verse 28, Therefore God give thee the dew or the rain of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty corn and wine. So the blessing that Jacob received is the blessing that comes for obeying the truth. That's what Leviticus says. That's the covenant that was made with Abraham. Obey me, all right, and you will be blessed. Walk before me and be thou perfect, all right? But if you don't walk before me, it says, then I will bring upon you seven times more plagues. I will punish you seven times for your sins. It's the same truth in this story with Jacob and Isaac. The same truth of blessings and cursings. Let us continue. Verse 29, it says, Let people serve thee, and nations bow down unto thee, to be lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Curse be everyone that curse thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. It's the same covenant made with Abraham. It's the same covenant made with Isaac. And now it's the same covenant made with Jacob. And it's the same covenant we find in Leviticus chapter 26. Let us continue. Verse, let's go to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 11. So keep in mind, I, I, Esau goes out into the field. He goes out into the field, and now uh, Jacob goes in, he gets the birthright, all right? The call for the bridegroom was made. The foolish said, give us of your oil. Esau, because he's a hunter, he didn't have a lamb with him at the moment. He had to go get one. Jacob, on the other hand, who's a shepherd, he had a lamb with him. He had the oil, all right? So Jacob was ready. The Bible says they that were ready went in with him. And the door was shut. But then the Bible says in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 11. Afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye neither know the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Let us see what happened to Esau when he returns. This parable was fulfilled by Esau. It says, And it came to pass, As soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of his father, that Esau his brother came in from hunting. Then came also all the other virgins. Came from what? Hunting came from buying from those that sell. Let us continue. Verse 31. And he also had made savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat this venison that thy soul may bless thee. In other words, Lord, Lord, open unto us. It continues. And Isaac, his father, said unto him, who art thou? Isn't that what Christ says to the foolish virgins? The Bible says in Matthew 25 and verse 12, I know you not. Isaac says, Who art thou? 
And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembling, trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? This is what Christ is going to say to the foolish. Who? How came in here without the wedding garment? How did you come in here, friend? How? Who are you? And the Bible is going to say, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. All right? To reject these truths, especially the seven times, is to reject the covenant made with Abraham. It's to reject the birthright. It's to reject your right to the benefits that comes with being a Seventh-day Adventist. Let us continue. Verse 33. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. The door was shut. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry, and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety, and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. Two things. You must have the birthright. You must be born into these truths. And you must have the experience. All right? You must have the experience which brings the blessings. Brethren, it's the first and second angel's message that leads to the third. You must have the birthright. You must be born into these truths. That what makes you a seven-day Adventist is your birth into these truths. And what brings your blessing is the experience that leads you down to October 22nd, 1844, where the Lord can bless you with truth. He can make you the, the repository of the truth as he made the Seventh-day Adventist church the repository of the truths concerning the sanctuary, um, the papacy, the book of Revelation, and all these things. And today we have many Esau's in our church seeking to kill those who hold to these truths as Esau sought to kill Jacob. Let us continue. Let us continue. It says in verse 37, And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And the corn and wine have I, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be with the fastness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob, because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning, the days of mourning, <coughs> for my father are at hand, then will I slay my brother Jacob. Esau sought to kill his brother. Now, not, though, not, not only does Esau and Jacob represent God's true servants, as in God's true leaders and God's true followers versus, God's, versus Satan's leaders and Satan's followers, Esau representing those bad leaders and, and, and the people who follow them, Jacob representing Christ 
and the people who follow him, or the good leaders and the people who follow him. Esau representing Satan, Jacob representing Christ. Read this passage again, Genesis chapter 27, and where you see Esau and Jacob, insert Christ and Satan. But then the question may come, are you saying that Christ tricked his father into giving him the birthright? Are you saying Christ is a supplant? Let us continue. Let us continue. These are the questions that arise. When you make this about Christ and Satan, then you, then you have to ask these questions. Jacob was a supplanter. How was Christ a supplanter? All right. Let us continue. Go now to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. That enmity, that enmity is placed when one received the blessing and the other received the curse. Esau was made servant to his brother. Is there another story in the Bible where brother was made servant to brother because of a curse? Genesis chapter uh, 9, I believe, 8 or 9. So let us continue. Let us read one more thing here. Who is Esau? Esau is the firstborn. All right. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 25 and, and verse 25, and the first came out red all over like a hairy garment and they called his name Esau. And the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. Esau is those who is always out doing public evangelism, doing uh, feeding the poor. They are these guys. They're always out there, right, doing some work. In fact, in, two SM, in 1 SM 204, Sister White says, they will go into the cities and do a wonderful work. That's Esau, right? However, the Sabbath is lightly regarded. They don't want the birthright and they don't have the garment. They don't want the birthright, but they want the blessing. Whereas Jacob, okay, he's a supplanter. All right? Jacob was a supplanter. And in Genesis chapter 27, verses 18 to 24, we have the story there of Jacob tricking his father. Esau is Satan, Jacob is Christ. What does supplanter mean? It means heel catcher. A supplanter is one who catches the heel. But what does it mean to supplant? To supplant means to remove or displace or to displace and take the place of. Now ask yourself this question, is Christ removing and displacing anyone? Is Christ going to remove and displace anyone? Yes. Christ, is Christ on the cross removed Satan from rule of this earth. He displaced him. All right, Satan has no more place in this earth. In fact, he has no more place in this universe. Brethren, Christ is a supplanter. In the truest form of the word, Christ is a supplanter. The difference between Christ and Esau, or Christ and Jacob, is that Jacob did it unconverted. Christ did it in Christ will do it and is doing it in righteousness. There is a righteous way to supplant, and then there is an unrighteous way to supplant. And we saw that because Jacob supplanted his father, Right, or supplanted Esau, took displaced and took the place of Esau, he faced a punishment for that. Jacob had to accept that punishment. That's what the seven times says. Was Christ punished for being a supplanter? Yes, he was. But was he punished for sin? No, he wasn't. He took on sin. He became sin for us. In fact, he took on Jacob's sin. And he performed it righteously. That might be a new concept to you, but there is a righteous way to do all the things that evil men have done and are continuing to do. Adam, he died for his wife. Did Christ die for his wife? Yes, he did. There is a righteous way to die for your wife. Christ covered Adam by dying for his bride. 
Christ covered Jacob by becoming a supplanter. Let us, let us continue. The Bible says to supplant means to remove. No, sorry, the dictionary says to supplant is to remove or displace. Or to take the place of. Or to overthrow or undermine. Is Christ undermining the enemy? Praise God. Now let us go to Romans chapter 4, verses 7 to 9. And 23 to 25, it says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. What does it mean that your sins are covered? All right. What does that mean that your sins are covered? The Bible says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and sins covered. Christ is the one that covers all sins. It says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith is reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone. Abraham is not the only one to benefit from the covering. All right. It says that it was imputed to him, but for us also at the end of the world to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. The life of Christ is for our offenses and our justification. Christ became sin. Christ became a supplanter, which is what you and I are today when we sin. Christ became a supplanter. Whenever we sin, Satan takes the place of Christ in our heart, making us a supplanter. But when we accept Christ, Christ takes the place of Satan in our heart, making us a righteous supplanter. We righteously overthrow Satan so that Christ can sit on our heart. And so Christ... In covering Jacob's sin by becoming a supplanter is also covering our sins at the end of the world by becoming a supplanter. So let us continue. It says he was delivered for our offenses. All right. He became us. He became Jacob. He became Cain. He became Adam. He became Abel. He became Noah. He became Shem, Hammond. He became every man who had ever walked the face of the earth, whether righteous or sinful. Christ became them. He became Moses. And he took all that to the cross. He covered our sins. That's what the seven times is designed to teach us. Christ took on the curse. He took on the curse for us to cover us so we don't have to uh, 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 suffer the consequences of that curse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Where did Christ take on the sin? Gethsemane. Let's read. Matthew chapter 26, verses 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Christ went to his father. Amen? Christ went to his father, just like Jacob went to his father. Christ became sin. Jacob sinned. Jacob sinned. He tried to do it in his own merit. He didn't do it in the merits of Christ, whereas Christ went to the father, a righteous man, who, and he took on sin as Jacob took on sin, but Jacob, being a man, can't atone for himself. Christ, being both God and man, could atone, uh, being a righteous man that could atone for the sins of the world. Let us continue. The Bible, um, Sister White tells us in Steps to Christ that it was in Gethsemane that the spotless Son of God took upon himself the burden of sin. All right? So let's read now Matthew chapter 26 and verse 38. Skip Matthew 26 and verse 38 and go to two te- Testimonies, volume 2, page 206, paragraph 1. It says, We can have but faint conceptions of the inexpressible anguish 
of God's dear son in Gethsemane as he realized his separation from his father in consequence of bearing man's sin, he became sin for the fallen race. Jacob was separated from his father after his sin. He became sin for the fallen race. The difference between Jacob and Christ is Jacob cannot atone for the fallen race. But Jacob, uh, uh, his longing to commune with God, his longing to be near to God, showed that he wanted to be, uh, 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 to, bl to be a blessing to the human race. Because the covenant was, Abraham, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Jacob wanted to live up to that, so that in him, all the families of the earth could be blessed. But Jacob was human. He had to wait for Christ. He had to wait for Christ. In Gethsemane, Christ told the disciples, Tarry ye here. They also had to wait for Christ. All right? So, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 calls Christ the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This is out of Ages 834, paragraph 2. It says, Before the foundations of the earth was laid, the Father and Son had united in the covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. The death of Christ is the fulfillment of the covenant. What covenant? If you obey, I will bless thee. And if you disobey, I will curse thee. So Christ became a man, lived his life as a man, lived in obedience to God. And in the end, God blessed him. God blessed him with a new life. God blessed him with all those that will be obedient to the truth. Christ lived out the truth of the seven times. And by doing so, he covered every other person who would accept the truth of the seven times and enter into covenant with God and choose to obey God. Christ accepted it. Let us continue. Sister White says, But it, not, it, was not, it is not required of you or of me to be on a continual strain. We should surrender continually what he requires of us and he will show us his covenant. As we surrender, he's going to show us his covenant. Jacob didn't surrender in that moment. He went to get the covenant for himself and in mercy, God still showed him the covenant because he had a, had a, had a righteous longing for that covenant. But let us continue. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. We shall be instructed more deeply, more what? More deeply in the mystery of God, the Father, and of Jesus Christ. We shall have visions of the king in his beauty, of the who? Of the king in his beauty, and before us will be open the rest that remaineth for the people of God. We will soon enter the city whose builder and maker is God. The city we have long talked of. All right? So, all we have to do is wait for Christ. The Bible says, tarry, tarry here. All right? The Bible says, do it tarry. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not tarry. What is the Bible talking about here? The truth concerning the seven times. Though it tarry, wait for it. It shall speak and not lie. Jacob didn't wait, so he lied. Christ waited. He waited 4,000 years to come on this earth. And when he came, he spoke and he did not lie. He was a righteous man. And because of that righteousness, he was resurrected. And Ellen White tells us in this last quote that we, do, we just read, we don't need to be on the continual strain. All we have to do is surrender to what he requires of us, which is obedience. And he will show us his covenant. We will receive the birthright and in turn receive the blessing. Okay? And she says, we shall be instructed more deep, deeply in the mysteries of God. And we know that according to Revelation 10, the mystery of God is finished at the end of the world. She says, we shall have visions of the king. And a king has a kingdom. We shall have visions of the king in his beauty. And before us 
will be opened the rest that remaineth for the people of God. Brethren, this is a very, very solemn truth. And I pray to God that you heard his voice in the things that have been taught. This is not about me. This is not about living waters. This is not about any ministry, but this is about truth. And brethren, where you hear the truth, there you must plant your flag. It's as simple as that. And I pray that you are hearing the truth in what has been spoken. God is really, really, really trying to call his people back to the platform of truth. Please come back to the truths, to the foundation of Seventh-day Adventism. Many ministers are out there. Even some of them is even giving lip service to these things. But brethren, they don't understand the, the experience that comes with understanding the first and second angels' messages. And I pray that these things have touched your heart. If so, please support us with your tithes and offerings and donations as we continue to go forward doing the Lord's work. And if you require any further Bible study, if you have any questions, call us. Our number is uh, would be on the video. Um, our number is in the video in, in the at the end of the first video in, 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 in all our presentations in this series. Uh, it's 423-413-3536. Call us, text us, encourage us, whatever you do. Uh, um, please, please make a concerted effort to study these things for yourself that you may, uh, and see if these things be so, that you may plant your feet upon the rock. Don't be in a part of this new organization which surely will be destroyed. The Bible says, I mean, Sister White tells us that structure will be taken away. So shall we close with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, your terms are simple. Obey and be blessed. Disobey and be cursed. Help us, Lord, not to be like Esau, but help us to be like Jacob, who longed to be a progenitor of the truth, who longed to be uh, a priest, Lord, who longed to commune with God. And so he sought these things, O Lord. But help us not to do it in, a, in, in the same way that he did it, O Lord, whereby we would sin our soul to obtain something, even though it's good. There is a consequence for that. So, Lord, please help us not to go that route, but to be like Christ and to be patient and to wait, O oh Lord, and to, to go to the cross. Help us to deny self, Lord, that, that, that your, 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 your ways uh, will, will, will take effect in our lives and that we may live after uh, the, the covenant that you've made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Help us to be children of that covenant. Help us, O oh Lord, to have the enmity that you, that, that you are giving to the seeds uh, of Eve at the end of the world. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Why should I feel discouraged Why should the shadows come Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is He. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know. He watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me.
I sing Because I'm happy Yes, I sing Because I'm free For his eye Is on The sparrow And I know He watches Over me His eye And I know he watches I know he's watching over me I know he's watching over me And I sing because And I know he's watching over me. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he's watching over me. He's watching over